Welcome to the inventory tutorial. I'm going to demonstrate how to get the most out of this particular tool. If you've logged into the Iowa Doc site, you can then either use the search bar in the top right hand corner to search for inventory, or alternatively, you can navigate to the inventory set procedure. From the probate forms to the probate inventory procedure forms, and then you run the probate intake procedure. Once the template has loaded, you'll see that you're presented with a number of options. There's also a select all button, which you can select and that will select every single template or deselect every single template. You'll see that as you select templates, options will open up on the left hand side. Those tabs contain the corresponding information for the options that you have selected. I'm going to select the first five. Now let's run through the interview tabs. In the caption information tab, we add a court county and the case number, which is also the probate number. And then the final question asks you to insert a name for your answer file. This is the name that your answer file will be given when you save your data. When I click the save button, I get a file called P123Johnny, which is exactly what I inserted at that field we can use that data file at a later date. Get size tab is self-explanatory and now we move on to the parties. The first party we can add is a preparer. The preparer is usually added from your firm information uh, which is pre-populated or you can add a custom one if necessary. I'm just going to select someone from my firm. You can then add your decedent. The marital status of the decedent will determine whether or not you will be able to add a spouse. And the same goes for children. You would have to have children in order to see children information. If I select single and I do not click the decedent has children button and I confirm, you'll see that there, are, there is no spouse or child party available to me in the main party page. Once you've completed the decedent's information, you can then move on and add everyone else. You'll notice that in the spouse tab, there is an option to say that the spouse lives with the decedent. If you check that and you say yes, you won't see any effect on the interview. However, the template will know to insert the decedent's address at the spouse's address field. But if you say no, you will then be given the option to add a custom address for that spouse. Top of the spouse and child tabs, you will see a question that says party is a beneficiary. It might say party is an heir, depending on whether the decedent is to state or intestate. That controls whether or not that party will appear on your cover page. The heirs tab has a very similar setup. An heir can obviously be an individual or a corporate entity. It does say heir at the top. Uh, and we use the term heir and beneficiary interchangeably here. I know that's legally incorrect, but for the purposes of these templates, they behave in the same manner. Okay, I'm going to proceed to load some information that I've created before and saved. We now have some parties that I have pre-populated. Added a corporate heir called Mom and Pops, who is presented by Mary Walker. And I've added a couple of children. In my master list, I see I've only selected two, so I'm going to proceed and add an additional three templates there. There's a possibility. You can set up your templates and reload that data later to continue working on it or to add an additional uh, schedule to the inventory set. One thing to note, is that the file name that you inserted before will be overridden by the file name of the data that you load. So if you want to change that, just be just bear that in mind. I'm going to proceed and call this um, by the name of the decedent. I'm going to call it Tim Bell Inventory Set. Now we'll proceed to uh, insert the information into the actual schedules. You can add alternate values if you want. Uh, 
it is set up to deal with that, but I'm going to proceed without those alternate values. Let me add my first piece of real estate, the big house. In the value section, I can add the number in an unformatted uh, manner. So I can just put one, two, three, four, five, and the system will recognize that as a number. You can also add those numbers in a formatted manner with uh, commas as thousand separators and a full stop as the decimal separator. As long as you do not insert a space in your number, the system will recognize that as a number. Now you'll see that I have an additional piece of real estate, simply called real estate, that contains no information. If I leave that there, a third field on my template, on my document, will appear. I will have my big house, my warehouse on the docks, and a blank one. So I'll have a third one that, has, that contains no information. I don't want that third piece that third piece of real estate to appear on my document, I need to delete it here using the trash can on the right hand side. I'm now going to add some stocks and bonds. Uh, the stocks and bonds are calculated for you. So if I've got one share in Coca-Cola worth 50,000, that will be calculated and there's my value over there. Or perhaps I have shares in Taste Holdings. Maybe I have 9,000 of them and they're worth 75 cents each, then that will calculate for me. Okay, and I'm just going to put in a little bit of cash and we can move on to the actual recapitulation schedule. Here you will see that these numbers have been calculated for you. Um, they are open, so you can change them. If, if you know something that you haven't put into the recapitulation, into any of the other schedules, you want to change that value, you can. If you have made manual changes and you want to uh, and you want to revert them, you want to recalculate them, all you need to do is delete that number that you manually inserted and click in Schedule A and it will recalculate everything for you. This calculation occurs in the actual schedules too. So for example, if I put some values into Schedule E1 and then I go back and add Schedule E1, when I come back here, you'll see that that actual number calculated from the schedule will now be in there. We then move on and we add the real estate uh, owned outside of Iowa and the property reported but excluded from the gross estate. And then we move on to the federal tax calculator. Here we can insert a custom amount if we want to, or alternatively, you can use the button to calculate the gross estate value. I'm going to change my mind about Schedule E1 and delete it completely. And then I'm going to hit the Preview button. What will happen then is a tab will open containing all of the documents that we are going to be generating. See on the very far left, there's a bar that says Documents, and in there is Document 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and you can just select which one you want to have a look at. Um, I'm going to go to the Real Estate Schedule, and you'll see that there is the numbers that we put in. They are formatted in the correct style, regardless of how you inserted them. So if you put them in without commas uh, it, and without decimals, it will insert in the template, in the actual document, as a fully formatted number, uh, along with the totals for each of those particular schedules that you've selected. The same applies in the recapitulation schedule. All those numbers will be formatted and then the total appears at the bottom. I selected a small estate, so I've got this additional page attached to my recapitulation schedule with some uh, a summary. If I'm not happy with something I've seen in my preview, I can just go back into my interview and I can change that data. So here I'm going to go back to the real estate. I'm just going to quickly change the value of my warehouse at the docks. And once I'm happy with everything, I go to the very last tab. And you'll see on the bottom right hand side, there's a button called Assemble. And you click that Assemble button and your documents will assemble and you will be able to download them.